Hello everyone, and welcome to the first chapter of Sketchy Farm. For those of you seasoned Sketchy veterans, welcome back. Hopefully you'll appreciate how we build on your knowledge from other Sketchy videos by craftily intertwining existing symbols from prior sketches into new ones. For those of you new to Sketchy, I'm Andrew Berg, and I'll be one of your guides through the magical world of Sketchy Farm. Sketchy Medical deemed me an expert in the field, qualified to teach this course, because I satisfied their two conditions. One, I, for the most part, graduated high school. And two, I was able to correctly pronounce metoprolol. So, I'll be your trusted sketchy narrator through this video, and many more, and I have the honor of introducing the pharmacology course. So, pharmacology hasn't changed very much over the what, four millennia it's been around? Consider the Ebers Papyrus, which dates back to 1550 BC. It describes numerous medicinal practices of ancient Egypt, including magical formulas for birth control and incantations to rid the body of evil spirits. All of this wealth of Egyptian knowledge was carefully condensed down into hieroglyphics, or representative images that preserve a body of knowledge that can be passed down from generation to generation. These crude hieroglyphics have since then been transcribed to Greek, Latin, then to English, taken from stone tablets to meticulously crafted illuminated manuscripts, through the Gutenberg Press to become mass-produced books, eventually becoming volumes of digital libraries that are now being shared instantly, globally through the cloud. Only to finally arrive here, Sketchy Farm, where we aim to set your learning back 3,500 years to a time where, once again, we'll condense everything we know about pharmacology into little representative visual symbols. Welcome to the age of sketchy glyphics. With that, let's get started. Our first chapter covers the drugs that modify autonomic function, Specifically, we'll start with the cholinomimetic drugs. They're called cholinomimetic because they mimic or modify the effects of acetylcholine, the primary neurotransmitter of the parasympathetic nervous system. For that reason, these drugs are also sometimes referred to as parasympathomimetics. So at this parasympathetic port town, let's sketch in a billboard at the top of the scene that reads, Enjoy acetylcholine. To remind you that the drugs depicted in the scene are acetylcholine receptor stimulants. This again means that they are cholinomimetic. So on the sign, we have a mime enjoying a refreshing cold bottle of acetylcholine. Early studies of the parasympathetic nervous system showed that there are two important acetylcholine receptor subtypes. Those stimulated by muscarin, or muscarinic receptors, and those stimulated by nicotine, or nicotinic receptors. Nicotinic receptors will be represented by a smoker here on the left. These nicotinic receptors are found on autonomic ganglia and skeletal neuromuscular junctions. So to highlight this, let's put some of these ganglia-like transformers on the telephone pole. Think of it as the location where preganglionic wires synapse with postganglionic wires. So, from wire to wire. Also, see this wire leading down to an electrical outlet? This outlet plate is our recurring symbol for the motor end plate, here to remind you of nicotinic receptors at the neuromuscular junction. Nicotinic acetylcholine receptors can also be found in one more important organ, the adrenal gland. Classically, autonomic fibers first synapse on a ganglion before reaching target organs while well, they can also synapse onto the adrenals, which substitute as a postganglionic organ to produce blood-borne neurotransmitters. And everyone knows that the adrenal gland is basically the hat of the kidney. It really does make the kidney look like it's wearing a beanie. So our nicotinic receptor smoker is sporting a floppy and surprisingly anatomically correct adrenal beanie. Again, this is to remind you that nicotinic receptors act directly on the adrenal gland. So while nicotinic receptors are found at ganglia, adrenals, and skeletal muscle, muscarinic receptors are found at the autonomic effector tissues, such as the smooth muscle of the heart and of the glands, 
but not in the ganglia. We'll depict the muscarinic receptor subtypes here in front of this convenience store as three motorcycle parking spots, M1, M2, and M3. So nicotinic and muscarinic receptors can be differentiated not only by their anatomic location, but also by their transmembrane signaling mechanisms. Nicotinic receptors are transmembrane polypeptides that act as ion channels. And behind our nicotinic smoker, we can see TV screens showing the ion channel news. Activating a nicotinic receptor leads to the influx of positive ions, which then depolarize a skeletal muscle cell, for example. Muscarinic receptors, on the other hand, are coupled to G proteins that function as transducers, and each G protein class leads to a specific set of intracellular messages. See this sign on the convenience store, Quick Mart? If the smog doesn't kill you, our slashed prices will. QIQ represents the G protein class coupled with each muscarinic receptor subtype. M1, M2, and M3 coupled to GQ, GI, and GQ, respectively. Each G protein regulates the production of intracellular second messengers. GQ activates the IP3 DAG cascade, or as I like to call it, the three DAGs, represented by these three cute canine riding buddies in the sidecar of the GQ-coupled motorcycles, M1 and M3. This leads to increased intracellular calcium. GI, on the other hand, leads to the inhibition of cyclic AMP production, as represented by the packed-up tent, like a packed-up and inhibited camp in the saddlebag of the GI-coupled motorcycle, M2. Notice the down arrows we've included as well? When cholinomimetic drugs activate muscarinic receptors, they mimic the effect of parasympathetic nerve discharge at end organs. Each muscarinic receptor subtype can be found at specific effector organs. M1, for example, can be found in the CNS and enteric nervous system, as represented here by the M1 rider's brain helmet and enteric GI exhaust. M2 is all about the heart. It can decrease heart rate at the SA node, decrease contractility of the atria, and decrease conduction velocity through the AV node. This is represented by the biker's torn leather jacket. It has a heart emblazoned on it, and only the atria are visible, as well as the two jewels representing the SA and AV nodes. Notice that the bottom of the jacket is stylishly torn off, which means the ventricles are missing. Direct parasympathetic activity of the ventricles is sparse. When you think of contractility of the ventricles, think of the sympathetic nervous system instead. M3 muscarinic receptors are found on numerous effector organs, including glands, the bladder, and the smooth muscle of the eye. To highlight this, he's holding a gland-like sponge, and these Easy Rider stripes on his motorcycle should remind you of the smooth muscle organs activated by the parasympathetic nervous system. A lot of these parasympathetic effects are mimicked by the acetylcholine receptor stimulants that will be incorporated into the rest of the scene. So here, this rider is giving an acetyl-cola toast to the city. There's one little quirk of M3 muscarinic receptors to mention. Intravascular injection of muscarinic agonists produce marked vasodilation. I don't want you to overthink this, but it seems counterintuitive. You'd expect smooth muscle activation would cause vasoconstriction, right? Well, activation of these M3 receptors leads to the release of nitric oxide from vascular endothelial cells. This nitric oxide then diffuses to adjacent vascular smooth muscle cells, where it leads to increased cyclic GMP and causes relaxation. This is represented by this dilated nitric oxide exhaust pipe seen on the back of this motorcycle. When the endothelium is damaged, however, as occurs with atherosclerosis, this action is eliminated, and then this allows for the opposite effect to take place. Muscarinic agonists then come into direct contact with arterial smooth muscles, leading to vasoconstriction. This is represented by this smaller, constricted exhaust pipe that's clogged with atherosclerotic debris. So remember, in the average patient, muscarinic agonists can lead to vasodilation due to nitric oxide release, causing a drop in blood pressure. Remember, however, that cholinomimetic drugs are often non-selective, acting sometimes at all three receptor subtypes. 
So even if they're used clinically to improve GI function, for example, you'll want to watch out for the cardiovascular effects they may have. The first cholinomimetic agent that we'll cover is bethanicol, represented by Beth, the construction worker, downing a crisp, cool bottle of acetylcholine. Muscarinic agonists increase the secretory and motor activity of the gut. See the cement truck behind her? It's pouring out a fresh slab of cement out of a spout that looks rather colonic. Think of bethanicol when treating non-obstructive GI disorders such as post-op ileus, neurogenic ileus, or even congenital megacolon. This do not obstruct sign should remind you of these non-obstructive causes of ileus. Muscarinic activation of GI smooth muscle cell treats an inactive bowel, but will not help with an obstructed bowel. Because muscarinic agonists stimulate the detrusor muscle and relax the sphincter muscles of the bladder, bethanicol can be used to treat non-obstructive urinary retention. And as you can see, Beth is watering down the cement with a hose that resembles a functioning and free-flowing bladder. So some of these indications include post-op or postpartum urinary retention or neurogenic bladder from the spinal cord injury. Let's sketch in our next cholinomimetic agent, pilocarpine represented, of course, by a pile of carp. Notice the crane at the parasympathetic port town is carrying a fresh load of fish, glistening wet with their gaping mouths dripping with seawater. This is to remind you that pilocarpine increases salivary secretion, so it can be used to treat dry mouth caused by Sjogren's or radiation damage or from side effects from other meds. Pilocarpine can also be used to treat glaucoma. Muscarinic agonists reduce intraocular pressure by causing contraction of the ciliary body, facilitating the outflow of aqueous humor. The ciliary body is the part of the eye that's connected to zonular fibers to control accommodation of the lens. When the ciliary muscle contracts, the zonular fibers relax, and then the lens forms a more spherical shape. So notice that above the net carrying the carp, we've added these glass floats representing the spherical accommodated lens. The parallel fibers of the net are meant to resemble zonular fibers connected to the crane, which is now designed to resemble the smooth muscle cells of the ciliary muscle. Acute glaucoma can also be initially managed with muscarinic agonists. However, the mechanism for acute glaucoma is slightly different. In acute glaucoma, it's important to relieve pressure by causing meiosis. Pilocarpine does this by activating the sphincter pupillae muscle. So cholinergic agonists cause meiosis. And this pupillary constriction is represented by the fisherman who draws closed the hood of his jacket, which resembles contraction of a sphincter. Another muscarinic agonist that's used to constrict the pupil and reduce intraocular pressure is carbacol. This glaucoma treating agent will be represented by the resident of this apartment above Quickmart. Not the best location, but what a view. Notice he's also drawing his hood closed, like a constricting pupil, because of the carbon fumes rising from the street below. That's carbon to remind you of the name carbacol. In fact, these fumes are emanating from the nicotine smoker to remind you that carbacol is not just a muscarinic agonist, but also a nicotinic agonist. Our last muscarinic agonist is methicoline. Oh, you didn't know? Today is the Paracity Marathon Challenge. The Marathon Challenge represents methicoline challenge. When this agent is used to instigate asthma during asthma testing. Notice that the first place competitor has already crossed the finish line? Acetylcholine, the taste of victory. The guy behind him, however, isn't doing too well. Muscarinic stimulants can contract the smooth muscle of the bronchial tree, leading to symptoms of wheezing. This is a good time to reiterate the nonspecific activity of these muscarinic agonists. Cholinomimetic agents, in general, can mimic all kinds of parasympathetic effects, so watch out for exacerbation of COPD, asthma, and peptic ulcers when giving these agents to susceptible patients. Before we wrap up this sketch, I want to mention one more drug, varenicline. It's a partial agonist at nicotinic receptors, and as such, it's used to treat smoking cessation. So on the telephone pole behind our nicotinic smoker, We'll sketch in a flyer for a smoking cessation hotline. Remember, that's 1-800-VERY-CLEAN for varenicline. All right, let's sum up this sketch. Cholinomimetics act at acetylcholine receptors. 
Nicotinic acetylcholine receptors can be found in autonomic ganglia, the adrenals, and skeletal muscle. An example of a nicotinic agonist is varenicline. Muscarinic acetylcholine receptors, M1, M2, and M3, are at the effector organs. Muscarinic agonists therefore exhibit parasympathetic effects. Beth represents the bowel and bladder activating bethenicol. The pilocarping pilocarp symbolizes this agent's ability to increase salivary secretions to treat Sjogren's. It's also able to contract the ciliary body and sphincter pupillae to treat glaucoma. Carbenicol can also constrict the pupil to treat glaucoma, represented by our carbon fume fearing apartment resident. And our methacholine marathon challenge symbolizes the wheezing induced by this asthma exacerbating drug. Remember, watch out for exacerbation of COPD, asthma, and peptic ulcers with all colon emetics. All right, well, that's it for acetylcholine and the colon emetics. I think acetylcholine actually has some potential. It just needs a good tagline. How about acetylcholine, consistent and timeless? It looks the same entering the body as it does when it leaves. Hmm, where's Don Draper when you need him? <laughs>